Welcome to the Tech Ed Podcast, where we visit with leaders who are shaping, innovating, and disrupting technical education. People who are not afraid to think differently, not afraid to try something new, all with the goal of securing the American dream for the next generation of STEM and workforce talent. We have two guests with us today that are doing exactly those types of things, innovating and shaping the future of technical education. We are going to dive in to introducing our two guests. The first is Dr. Sue Elsperman. Sue was selected in the year 2016 to serve as the president of Ivy Tech Community College of Indiana, becoming the ninth individual and the first female to hold that position. She served as Indiana's 50th lieutenant governor from the year 2013 until March of 2016. She also served as president of the Senate and Secretary of Agriculture and Rural Affairs, as well as overseeing six agencies. Dr. Elsperman has more than 30 years of experience in higher education, economic, and workforce development, and serving as a public official. She is not new to the world of higher education. From 2006 to 2012, she served as the founding director of the Center of Applied Research and Economic Development at the University of Southern Indiana. She also has classroom experience teaching there and at the University of Evansville and the University of of Louisville. Dr. Elsperman, thank you so much for joining us on the Tech Ed Podcast. It's my pleasure. Happy to be here. And we are so happy that you're here as well. I want to also introduce your colleague, Mr. Chris Lowry. Now, Chris is Ivy Tech's Senior Vice President of Workforce and Careers. He serves as the Chief Workforce Officer for Indiana's statewide community college. Prior to his current role, he served as Chancellor for Ivy Tech's Columbus Southeast Region. And prior to that, he led public policy and engagement for Hillenbrand Inc. in Batesville, Indiana, where he was responsible for corporate communications, public affairs, and government relations. During his 20-year career with Hillenbrand, he served in a variety of management and leadership capacities, including at Batesville Casket Company, where he was responsible for sales development, human resources, acquisition, integration, product leadership, and marketing and strategic planning. His background also includes serving as assistant to Indiana Governor Bob Orr, and his legislative assistant to Senator Dan Quayle. Chris, it is so great to have you with us as well. Yeah, Matt, thank you. Glad to be here. And we're going to dive in, Chris, right away with a little bit of a conversation with you around your experience at Hill & Brand. Now, I have to tell you, I actually know that company a little bit. I was a supplier to, to Hill Ron both before and after the spinoff. And I, I had actually two things that I loved about visiting Batesville, and I spent time with Batesville Casket as well. The first one was obviously meeting and talking with all the great people at Hill & Brand. The other thing was we don't have Skyline Chili here in the state of Wisconsin where I live. So, <laughs> so we went... We would always make it a point to stop, but great memories of my relationship, the region that you spent so much time in back in those days with Hill and Brand. So tell us a bit about your experience there and how that is serving you well in your current role at Ivy Tech. Oh, Matt, thanks so much. By the way, uh, Skyline is still a standard bearer here in Batesville, along with a lot of great German food. So we'll take you out for some of that when you're here next. It's almost a challenge to tell you how impactful my life at Hill and Brand was on the work that I had the privilege of doing today. You know, classical stalwart of an employer here in Indiana, one of Indiana's top publicly traded private companies. It was 20 years of learning and growing. Sue Elsperman knows this. I refer oftentimes to my learning in lean. You know, I look back to Hill and Brand, we had three key pillars, talent, lean, and strategy. It's a rare day that I don't find myself supported by one of those key areas. And in my final years in the role that I had out of the CEO's office, I was allowed to do some things with and for the company that were also personal interests, like workforce development, like really helping us lean into a commitment to education. And we were talking about the looming war for talent. And our CEO at the time, a a former Vietnam helicopter pilot, by the way, looked at us and said, so there's this looming war for talent. We win. Go figure it out. Wow. You know, what do you do with that? I also had the privilege of being involved directly in education at the same time. I served on our local school board of trustees and for the last seven of those 12 years as president. And it was really then that I was introduced to Ivy Tech. And so sort of a confluence of things. National Association of Manufacturers was publishing along with Deloitte, the skills gap reports. My chairman of the board still is Joe Lokery, former chairman of the board also at Lumina. Our chair of the board had been the leader in working with NAM and the Manufacturing Institute to commission this report. So the confluence of Joe's work, what we were trying to do as a corporation to really think prospectively about our company and our communities and so forth started to come together. And then my own interest in education and workforce that goes back 30 some years. It's just hard to even tell you the impact that it's had. 
Absolutely. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned a couple of things. First of all, you and I could probably have a couple hour long conversation about lean. I'm a Kaizen and continuous improvement disciple in a, in a huge, huge way. Spent, you know, 20 plus years in manufacturing, doing a lot of those same types of things. And, and really one of the things that fascinates me in the world of education is people that are trying to drive waste out of the, out of the system yes. of education in much the same way that I'm sure you did on the, on the manufacturing industrial and process side. Dr. Elsperman, it's been two years, believe it or not, since we were together uh, in December of 2018 on a, on a meeting that uh, Paul Perkins put together. But Sue, certainly looking at opportunities to drive waste out of education, that's a huge part of what you do at Ivy Tech. And that was evident in the time we spent with you. You're no stranger to education. We referenced your time at USI and elsewhere prior to becoming the 50th Lieutenant Governor of the state of Indiana. But your career took you to the very highest echelons of Indiana government. What led you back to education? Thank you. It's a great question because most people don't leave a position as lieutenant governor to go do something else. But as I was lieutenant governor, understand I had the prior experience in higher ed. I'm also an industrial engineer by degrees, but I had seen as I was lieutenant governor traveling 92 counties. And I know that skyline chili that you're talking about and the good German food of Batesville. But I also met with hundreds of industry leaders and local economic developers and understood the importance of Ivy Tech to the future of the state of Indiana. We have adopted the Lumina goal. The Lumina goal is 60% of our workforce having a post-secondary credential by 2025. I worked with Joe Locri on that Indiana Career Council as Lieutenant Governor, where we set forth a strategic plan. How would we create a successful Indiana in 2025? How are we going to get there? Ivy Tech, being the statewide singly accredited system we are, has a reach that almost no other community college in the nation has. And it's a huge lift that Indiana has to take. So when I was approached with the retirement of the president at the time of Ivy Tech and others associated with Ivy Tech approached me, I really had to think and discern about, is this a better seat on the bus for me to lead this effort, which was going to be critical to the success of industry in Indiana? And you know what? Over the last couple of decades, we haven't always been winning. We are moving in that direction and we have strengthened our manufacturing. And in fact, Indiana is the most manufacturing intensive state in the nation, but it wasn't going to continue without some very intentional effort and the opportunity to lead Ivy Tech Community College and have people like Chris Lowry there who was like-minded. We had to be even more intentional and we had to find another gear and another level of alignment with industry. So it was not really a hard decision at the end of the day. And I can tell you, Matt, having watched politics the last four years, I don't miss it <laughs> one little bit. Shh, keep that our little secret. But what we're doing, what Chris and I are privileged to do every day, and we talk about this all the time, it truly is an honor and a privilege to get to be at the ground level, helping skill up Hoosiers, helping industries to strengthen, helping to attract new companies to Indiana, and helping to know that we're literally growing the next leaders of Indiana to ensure the future and prosperity of all Hoosiers. And you're ensuring that prosperity for all Hoosiers in really, really unique ways. The words you use, statewide, singly accredited institution. I don't know that everybody necessarily knows what that means. You explained that to us when we were on a trip to Indiana. And so our audience knows we we, uh, there was a group led by uh, Ron Wanick. Ron is the chairman, founder of Ashley Furniture Industries, largest furniture manufacturer in the world. And Ron brought people from school district administrators, community college presidents. We had the chancellor of the Polytechnic University in the state of Wisconsin really travel all over, not just the United States, but all over the globe, looking at best practices in technical education. And that trip led us to the state of Indiana because of how unique your approach to technical education is. I can tell you that to a person, Every one of those individuals was absolutely amazed at how well aligned your organization is across the entire state. And I'd like you to share just a little bit about, first of all, that alignment and how it's so unique and also how you managed to bring that to pass. Ivy Tech started as a vocational college in 1963, but around 2000, it took on the mantle of being Indiana's community college. So it took on not only the technical education, but the general eds, that transfer mission, if you will, that Indiana really didn't have. 
who became the statewide singly accredited. Why is that important? If you look at most states, you would have a community college representing one, two, or three, four counties, and they're all independent. That means every program they have has to be independently accredited. So advanced manufacturing degree at Community College X is not the same as that degree or credential at Community College Y. So if I move, I may lose a lot of credit or I may not be able to find that program. In Indiana, if you are, let's use nursing, it's easy because it's on all 18 of our campuses. If you start a nursing degree in Fort Wayne, and transfer, you can finish the exact same degree in Evansville. And that's true of all of our campuses. So that singly accredited means once we accredit a program with our regional or that accrediting agency, we can offer it across whichever campus is 18 and all. We can offer those in whatever community needs that program or whatever employer needs that program. And that is incredible for sizing up, sizing down, bringing in new. We're not doing it 18 times. We're doing it once. So we're getting ready to stand up the new smart manufacturing degree. When that's approved, it can be offered on any of those 18 campuses, six of them, 10 of them, 12 of them. We may shrink three of them. So that notion of right program, right place, right size has been a mantra in parallel to that thinking, the General Assembly really helped us out in 2016. They weren't happy enough with the alignment and the intensity of that alignment with our employers in Indiana. So they wrote a bill. They said the president of Ivy Tech shall hire a chief officer of workforce. And that would be parallel to the provost. So in very few higher ed institutions, will you have a senior vice president provost and a senior vice president of workforce alignment now called workforce and career. So Chris came in and we as an institution understood under no uncertain terms that the state of Indiana expected us as a statewide singly accredited college, no other community college in there, we own it. So we better get it right. I will say this was an instance where having legislation with your name on it made my job and his job easier. Because had it just been Sue's idea or Chris's idea, how many people in the community and within our institution, because no one else does it that way, how many would say, oh, that's a terrible idea. You know, you're, you're taking power away from academics. No, Chris and our provost are partners. And I'll let you talk more, Chris, about how we make that happen. Uh, Sue, thanks. Great setup. We are partners. Dr. Kara Monroe, our provost, and I describe it as we have a braided relationship. And truly, you know, when you braid something together, it becomes stronger than individual threads. And we think of it as one plus one equals hopefully something more like three. And it's not us, but it's the work of the teams across the state who work closely together. You know, the alignment goes back very much to a couple of things. And you find them right up front in our strategic plan, the Lumina 60% goal. And also the recognition that in Indiana, we recognize that the data said we'll need to fill about a million jobs over the next 10 years. Boil that down a little further, you see that about half of those are in the, quote, middle skill, unquote, space. That's us. That's our responsibility here in Indiana. We need to have folks with appropriate credentials, credit, non-credit, skills credit, who can help fill those jobs over the next 10 years. Those are really critically important. The other thing as we think about aligning to make these things happen, is not doing it just to do it. We believe that we are the growth engine of Indiana that must and will move wages. That the folks we're trying to help prepare for the workforce or to skill up within the workforce, that's our ultimate goal. So what do we do? We turn to good work that was already underway in terms of the strategic plan that had been developed by the Indiana Career Council at the time. Well, the co-chairs of that were Sue Elsperman and Joe Lokery. I had been connected to that work back in my life at Hillenbrand. We were all you know, deeply involved in this. There were three primary pillars or components to that plan, and we adopted all of them and made them fit right for Ivy Tech to align, engage, and advance. So to align the system from K-12 to adult basic ed to community college, four-year employers, to really align those things and to align those to the economic sectors within Indiana to engage in a way that's really employer-centric and learner-centric, and then to advance along a demand-driven curve. So rather than having programs that were there simply because it was somebody's favorite, you know, hey, we'll have this program because Chris likes that, 
or Chris does a nice job of attracting students into it. Rather than doing that, turn to data to help us figure those things out. So what's the supply and demand look like? You know, what does the economy actually need today and what prospectively will it need tomorrow? So stepping back again in that alignment and the engagement piece of it, we restructured how we do things. Many community colleges have a credit side of the house and a non-credit side of the house. We had that until the fall of 2016 after Sue came on board as our president and then she and the board asked me to take on this role. And literally on a Monday morning, we did away with that and said, no more. And we're going to put this all together under a workforce umbrella that's braided very closely with our academic side of the house. We also made sure to hire individuals in key leadership positions to align to the economy. Someone leading advanced manufacturing, Sue Smith, you know, Aaron Bowdy leading business logistics and supply chain and so forth. And, and those folks keep a foot in two different places. They have got to know the pulse of that part of the economy every day. And then they've also got to know the pulse internally and make, making sure those things are communicating effectively to, to best serve Indiana. And in fact, I've heard Sue Smith use those exact words. So uh, that certainly speaks to that level of alignment. And, and she's an individual for whom I have a tremendous amount of respect as well. On this topic of alignment, one of the things that we hear from folks in some of the states where the community colleges aren't as aligned, and I would say that probably covers most of the states because very few are, are anywhere near as aligned as Indiana is, we'll hear from program chairs, from deans, maybe from instructors, look, our industrial employers are different. You know, if I'm in the northern part of my state, they have different needs, they have different technology, that you know, different types of businesses than, you know, three or 400 miles away somewhere else. How do you respond to that objection that, you know, we have to be so responsive to individual employers and regions that we can't align across the whole state? Pareto lives everywhere, 80-20. There is truth in the nuance that one organization might have compared to another. The vast majority of what's going on has commonality. So as we get ready to stand up Industry 4.0, whether it's Lippert Components up in Elkhart or Hillenbrand in Batesville, a lot of their work has great similarity they will have nuances. We tend to believe that, look, most of it is the same. But to ensure that, that also means that Sue Smith, who you know, has to have an incredibly strong relationship with the industry broadly, and then with leading voices and complemented in that process that the folks at our campuses, our employer consultants, our deans and program chairs in those areas also have to understand those nuances. And the one last thing I'll add on there, a couple of years ago, we thought it was so important to think that way that you know, one company or another might have enough nuance that they would like to see that bear out in their credentials. We created something called the interdisciplinary degree. Essentially, what it allows an employer to do is choose from a menu to essentially customize part of that and have, for example, in manufacturing, a degree that probably 80% of it is representative of what anybody would seek in their employee, but some percentage of it ends up getting personalized to really meet the needs of that company. In addition, you might see the equipment that that particular manufacturer, so whether they're using a FANUC robot or whether they're using Haas CNC equipment, you might see that change, you know, Cummins, you might see a Cummins engine being worked on at a Columbus, Indiana campus. So plenty of room for that regional difference built in while still, to, to Chris's comments, the, the skills are still fairly universal to those programs. Chris, I love that answer. You know, I just served on a DACUM, a curriculum design project in the state of Wisconsin about two weeks ago, and we talked about the, you know, Pareto principle or, or 80-20, or I even called it 90-10, not just across manufacturers, but across different segments of the economy. So we talked about how you know, if somebody's working in hospitality or somebody's working in retail or somebody's working in manufacturing or distribution, we have smart technology, smart sensors, devices, you know, data analytics. I mean, that port's not just among manufacturers, but across sectors. I think you're onto something and I think it's going to obviously serve you extremely well. Before we leave this topic of uh, this whole idea of alignment, Sue Elsperman, you shared with that group a couple of years ago, the formula that you used or the model that you used to make sure that the production, if you don't mind me using that term, of candidates or of, of students, of, of members of the workforce, doesn't outpace the demand for those positions. We do a huge disservice to a student if we prepare them for a career that doesn't exist. How do you go about measuring to make sure that individually across the state, 
you're matching the production of students, if you will, to the needs in the workforce. So now you're talking about the quadrants and we have four quadrants. The first quadrant is where there's more demand than there are students in our program. So that means those are programs we need to find a way to grow them either more campuses or bigger on the campus we're in. So we measure that using MZ data, et cetera. We look for which programs need to grow, quadrant one growing. Quadrant two, we do have some programs in the community college that are enrollment limited. For instance, nursing. Nursing is an expensive program. We only have so many clinical sites in a community. That's quadrant two, meaning we wish we could recruit more in. There are more There are more jobs out there. We have to very intentionally work at how do we grow that program. It's not easy. We've got to get partners. We've got to find more clinicals to make that happen. So we call that where it's constrained by the external forces. Quadrant three is where we have too many students in program and there aren't jobs out there. Criminal justice, not so much at Ivy Tech anymore, but four years ago, That was a problem. All those 18-year-olds watching CSI just said, oh, I want to be in criminal justice. So we had too many students for jobs that when they completed wouldn't be there. So we've worked very diligently to shrink any program that's in quadrant three. And then quadrant four is equilibrium. Now that's harder to find than we thought (laughs) four years ago, but it is that notion of trying to be plus or minus a handful of completions. Now with the With the length of time it takes to complete students, two years ago, we might have been in equilibrium. Well, now there's more demand, so that program shifts into quadrant one, or less demand, and we need to figure out how to shrink it further. So those four quadrants have really changed the way we think about programs, and every year, campuses have to report on how their programs are lining up. We measure by percentage of programs and completions in those quadrants. It is a metric now at Ivy Tech. And while it has taken some time to get everyone thinking that way, Chris, I think now, what if you say four quadrants at Ivy Tech, everyone knows what that means. And every program chair wants their program to be in quadrant one or four, right? But we are each year, we're making our decision at the college based on those four quadrants. And that's what's right for our students. Now, since we saw you two years ago, we stood up the career coaching and employer connections strategy. We knew we weren't good enough at encouraging students into those quadrant one type programs, particularly high wage, high demand programs. Let's use an African-American male student comes in at age 19 and doesn't know what they want to do. Historically, they would end up in general studies because they were searching. It's our responsibility when they get there to immediately begin doing some career coaching, help them through some assessments. If they need to shadow somebody in an industry, see if they like to do something, to get them by the end of that first term into a program that is high wage, high demand, to help them find a better outcome. And that's the intentional way we're taking to try to ensure that We're being true to both employers based on demand, but also true to the students so they have good information and can make good decisions about what program they choose. We're not going to force anybody into one, but we're going to help inform them about, did you know cybersecurity, you could be earning $70,000 two years out. Oh, (laughs) you know, maybe I'll give up criminal justice and do cybersecurity instead because that's where the demand is. And I think that the discipline we're trying to build across the college to make sure that we're number one, offering the programs that are needed for Indiana's economy and employers, but also that we're encouraging our students to pursue a career in a high wage, high demand, good future job. Well, I I think that's just so important in in looking at making sure that we're we're thinking through that pathway for the student that we're, you know, like we said at the intro to that question, you know, putting a a student in a program that isn't going to lead to a career, that isn't fair to anybody, least of all the student. You know, that part of the equation is so very important. You know, the other thing that we've been spending a lot of time looking at at the Tech Ed Podcast is where are students earning credits that can count for something when they get to the next step in education? And that's another area where you know, it's as amazing as we look across the country, how often we have students that are earning, quote, college credit 
and they end up with what we call credits to nowhere, right? They earn this credit. And yes, it's a college credit, but it doesn't count toward a, a tech diploma. It doesn't count toward an associate's degree. And that's a dis disservice as well. Let's talk a bit about this whole idea of stackable credentials and making sure that as students are earning credentials, gaining competencies and abilities at one level of education, that those actually count towards something, again, driving the waste out of the whole education pathway. The idea of stackable credentials has just been central to what we've been doing as a college for the past few years. To not do that is waste. And waste, among other things, it doesn't honor the people doing the work in the process. You know, the worst thing you can do is find a way to have somebody do hard work, earn a credential, and then say, oh, by the way, that doesn't count over here. Wait, why? Similarly, and we're really leaning into this more and more, is on the what has been referred to as non-credit. What we've been really intentional about is to say, how can we make sure that learners and employers understand this as a journey? So I might start out doing something like a single course. And today it's even just offered on the non-credit side. But if it's connected to, for example, in smart automation, Industry 4.0, that can then become part of the SACA, S-A-C-A, silver badge or gold badge. And then once we complete the formulation of the degree on which we're working today, it'll also be part of the associate degree in Industry 4.0. So Chris could get that course he needs today that the employer says, look, you get a 75 cent raise, it's $1,500 a year, but do that, that'll make you more valuable to us and you can earn more. Great. Now, though, once that supervisor says, yeah, but Chris, you know, if you also did the full SACA certification, you could be one of our supervisors. And, you know, you probably know that's another $10,000 a year. You see the logic to that and all of that to say that in each of these sectors, manufacturing, logistics, IT, and just across the board, we've really leaned into it and have said, we can't create credentials anymore without always having an eye toward that. The interesting thing about a stackable credential is if you begin with a CT, it's going to be very skill intensive. And then as you move up, you start adding more of the general eds. You took English 101 at the end of the credential, not at the beginning. We know those gateway courses are the things that stop an adult learner or someone who came out of high school not that well prepared. But when they can start with the skills-based courses, build their confidence, learn how to do college, know how to take exam, by the time they pick up that English or math, they're ready for it. So it opened up pathways to people. But we really think four-year institutions ought to be doing the same thing. I'm an engineer. I didn't get the really good courses to be an IE till my senior year. Instead, I had to take three semesters of physics four semesters of calculus, differential equations. You know, you had all of this that had to be done before. I think we've done what is really right by the student and right by industry by stacking smaller credential to bigger credential up towards that associate and bachelor's degree. It's, it's really profound. I don't know that many people understand the implications from the learner standpoint. And I've got actually three, I think, disclosures. The first one is that I'm a hands-on kinesthetic learner. So I was never a classroom learner. I, you know, I struggled all through my entire education pathway. I could not wait to get out of the lecture to, so we could just go do something, right? Get our hands on something. Most of the people that find their way into STEM careers are exactly that way. You know, they're hands-on kinesthetic learners. And so we take this student that's excited about technology, excited about tinkering with stuff, learning technology that way. And we stick them in an English classroom yeah. for the first, you know, the first year, the first semester, what have you. Doesn't make any sense. The second confession is I'm not an engineer, but I'm married to one. <laughs> so um, my, my wife, Renee, has a, a master's degree in, in, in engineering. She says all the time, if she had to do it over again, she would go to the community college for two years and get her hands on technology. Amen. Before she, I would same thing. Mm -hmm. so, so third disclosure, Chris, I, we have to let our audience know I did not put you up to that smart automation certification Alliance comment. <laughs> I serve on their national board along with great people like, like, um, known that. like Paul Perkins <laughs> and Paul Aiello and others. I think there's seven of us that were part of that founding board about two years ago. I am a huge, huge fan 
of the work that Jim Wall is doing with the Smart Automation Certification Alliance. And just a great example, I think, of how you can creatively work toward your Illumina 60% goal. Talk, talk to us just a bit about how important those third-party certifications are. You already mentioned Saka, but what are some of the other ones that you're involved with? I'm so glad you asked that too, Matt, because I was, I was just sitting here thinking, oh, we, we've got to talk about how all of this relates to the Illumina goal. Four years ago, our college awarded approximately 20,000 credentials, about half of which were associate degrees and about half of which were sub-associate academic credentials, certificates and technical certificates. Again, 20,000 about four years ago. And this most recent year, it exceeded 37,000. Wow. By the way, in the process, the associate degrees have basically stayed level. But then we've also worked really closely with the clearinghouse, with organizations now, including SACA, Manufacturing Skill Standards Council, Amazon Web Service, you know, just think of any of those that are really ubiquitous across economic sectors. We're counting only those that we know have economic value. It's a really important criteria for us. We alluded to it early in the discussion. We're holding ourselves accountable for wages of our students. We're accountable. It's a metric and we measure it. And the one by which we measure is that year's median wage. And how are we doing from a total completer population against that? And we've been increasing our percentage who are at or above that median wage. Back to the industry certifications. We only count those that have high value and that are at or above that to begin with. So those third-party certifications, those are certainly important for your students, for students that are going through, whether it's a technical diploma, an associate's degree, earning stackable credentials. We've talked all about that. Important too for the workforce, right? If you turn the clock back 40 years, believe it or not, the average incumbent or new manufacturing employee, industrial employee, they received anywhere up to 100 hours a year of skills-based training provided by their employer at work. Now, we lived in a different world back then, and certainly, you know, uh, unions had a huge role in, in terms of upskilling the workforce, and that's not necessarily the current model. Today, that average is more like five hours a year, and most industrial employers, if you look at it, are teaching lockout, tagout, bloodborne pathogens, the things that OSHA says we have to train. But then when it comes to upskilling our workforce, we kind of leave it there. Now, now, Paul Perkins, he told me a couple of years ago, I just thought this was an amazing statistic. He said 80% of the people that will be in the workforce 20 years from today are already in the workforce now. So we also have to think, Chris, about all of these people who are in the workforce that are still going to be here 20 years in a world that's changing with things like Industry 4.0 and advanced manufacturing and other technologies. Talk about your work on the workforce side for that incumbent work whose skills need to continue to evolve to remain relevant and valuable in the world of industry, manufacturing, IT, any of those venues. I'd like to talk about it in the context of some of our great partners. One of our stellar partners, Old National Bank, a few years back said, hey, we really take seriously the skills and so forth of our employees, but, but we take it seriously because we want them to have a future, whether they're choosing to stay with Old National or move on to someplace else. And so they worked with us to, to develop this uh, concept, Achieve Your Degree or AYD, wherein it would be easier for the student or the employee, easier for the employer, but fundamental to all of this was to say, what are the barriers in front of the adult? The employer says, hey, look, I've got tuition reimbursement and only 5% of it gets used. Why is that? Well, as we and they discovered, one of the key reasons is personal cash flow. So I'm the student who says, gosh, I'm going to take classes starting in January. And the employer says, great, good for you. We're proud of you. And as soon as you complete that semester and get your grades and submit the paperwork, now it's about June or July, we'll reimburse you. The average employer is going, well, gee, that's a great idea, but I don't have the cash flow to make that happen. So elements like that, we stepped back and said, well, let's just blow those barriers away. So we developed this Achieve Your Degree concept, concierge service. Our teams go to the employer and take care of everything there, enrolling, going through financial aid and so forth. Then from the employer perspective, we said, let us do a couple things to help you out. Let us, first of all, help you stretch your dollar. Matt, it is a rare occasion that any employer ever says, we'll reimburse you. By the way, how much financial aid will you get? And then the other thing we said was, okay, rather than the 10 people who are doing this, these programs, rather than them getting bills and submitting the paperwork and, and all that waste, how about this? We'll send you, employer, one bill, and we'll do it at the end of term. And by the way, if Chris didn't meet the requirements that you had set forth of 
a B or something like that, we'll go bill him directly. Trying to remove all the risk, we take the responsibility. And by the way, when the employer is behind and supporting what the employee is doing, much, much, much greater percentages of retention and completion. So ONB or Old National Bank really helped us develop and hone this. Cook Medical, Cook Group has taken it and just, wow, they've blown it out of the water. They've taken the idea that really focuses on the middle skill space. And they've said, how do we reach down into the community? In fact, they're doing it in conjunction with Goodwill and the Excel centers here in Indiana to help folks who don't have yet their high school equivalency and all the way up through graduate degrees. They're committed not only to their company and their employees, but really uh, even more broadly, their community. Perfect examples of just great, great partnerships. You know, it's interesting. I sat in on a presentation about six months ago about all the reasons that employees don't take advantage of tuition reimbursement, don't take advantage of employer-sponsored education opportunities. And, and it sounds like, Chris, you've hit on just about every one of those. I want to hear from both of you. We're, we're so interested in disruption, and we've talked a lot about how you've disrupted uh, the, the whole system of education in Indiana for the better and for the betterment of your students, for the betterment of your employees. I'm sure that disruption is going to continue. Can I ask you both to take a minute or two and just touch on this whole topic of disruption and what are we going to see both at Ivy Tech and across the country in the coming years in terms of disrupting the world of education? I think we're going to continue to see the skills-based approach to programming. Strata seen that in their research that more than 60% of those who want to go back want to go back, not for a degree, but for a credential of some sort of skills-based credential. I think we're going to continue to see, because of this rapid technological change, we're going to be reskilling all the time. So it's not going to be finish a degree or credential and be done. We have to continue to bring adults back to skill up and reskill and reskill. And we see it. We see lots of bachelor's degree earners coming to Ivy Tech to get that cybersecurity software development, SHRM certification, whatever that may be. Online is here to stay. We've been in online for 25 years, but this between spring and fall, we more than doubled our credit hours in online. And our students, we built better backends, as have some of the other online providers. There's not a big gap anymore to the learning, the ease of learning online compared to in-person, especially adult learners. Now that they've done it, they're like, oh, why would I want to leave my home and leave my kids and try to go on campus on, you know, in the middle of the winter when they're six inches of snow? And then the third, I'll add just one more, which is the modalities are going to be much more fluid. We just launched something we call Learn Anywhere, which allows a student every week to decide do I want to go on campus? If I want to meet my professor and be in class, because that's better for me, I can do it virtually like we're doing on this podcast. So we're just looking at each other and doing it that way. Or third, you, they can do it asynchronously. Same faculty member teaching in all three modalities at one time. We had over 2,500 students do that this fall, and they love it. And that is likely to be the future. We will have many fewer classrooms overall, much more virtual and online but meeting the student where they are, be they the traditional 18 to 20 year old or the working adult, single mom coming back whenever and making sure that education fits, that learning fits to them. Lots and lots of innovation in the world of tech ed. So same question to you, Chris Lowry, tell us how are we going to see education, particularly technical education, tech ed disrupted over the course of the next 36 months? having this conversation with somebody else this morning, I said, you know, I think it more of something like a biosphere than a road with some exit ramps and on ramps, that there's more of a, an ecosystem to this for the learner. We're just, I believe, starting to see this today within sort of an ecosystem, certainly education, but education from top to bottom. One of the ways I became involved as president of the school board and also working at Hillenbrand was to much more closely integrate with Ivy Tech and for Ivy Tech to much more closely integrate with the high school and not just in traditional dual credit, but literally in each other's buildings. And now what has been running for, I think, eight years, a co-op program in the community where student X spends part of her day or his day or week at the high school part of the day on the Ivy Tech campus and, and part of the day or week rotating through, through four employers. Similar to sort of a Swiss youth apprenticeship system, 
but much blurrier. Where should the child learn? Where should the student learn? The student should learn wherever it's best to learn, right? And to become skilled. Uh, but I think we'll see this continued interesting convergence of education, of government, of business or employers, of philanthropy, and also of the nonprofit sector. Anyway, those are some things on how education and you know, even beyond education, sort of the economic preparedness of our society is going to really change over the years. Absolutely. Well, and it's so exciting to see you engaging on all those different levels, you know, and I love the whole discussion around the integration of all those different stakeholders. And you really think about it, it really is an ecosystem. And if we can engage every single one of those aspects, whether it's not for profit, whether it's government, the employer, business, education, I mean, what an amazing future for technical education if we can we can figure that out. Thank you so much. I mean, this is just amazing. Really appreciate you taking some time for us. Well, Matt, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Tech Ed Podcast. If you haven't already, subscribe, leave a review, and if you like this episode, share it with a friend. New episodes launch every Tuesday, so listen in next week.